<laughs> okay, welcome to Christian Bible Chapel. We're here this evening. Let's continue our lesson in the community uh, of God. Now, the, for a couple of uh, Wednesdays, past two Wednesdays, we've been talking about the sovereignty of God and reprobation. Do we have any questions concerning that before we uh, before we move on? No. Okay. Any questions? All right. Okay. We're looking at tonight the sovereignty of God and human will. Now, in the human will. Now, perhaps this lesson will help you to uh, understand the previous lesson, which is the sovereignty of God in reprobation. Let's go to God in prayer, then let's get the, the meaning of the word uh, reprobation so we can understand the sovereign will of God in the human will. All right? let's, 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 let's have prayer first. Father, we thank you as we gather together here and there as we uh, study the word of God. May we open, may your spirit open the scriptures up to us that we may uh, analyze scripture upon scripture, line upon line, precept upon precept, that we may be governed by the, by the word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. Give us insight, give us wisdom, knowledge, and understanding that we may know the things of Christ as he would want us to know and reveal to us through the scriptures through the power of the Holy Spirit, that we can understand your word. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Now, for a couple of weeks now, we, we was looking at reprobation. Reprobation is the act of God, his sovereign act. Okay, let's, let's sort of write this down. So, the other two, reprobation, is the sovereign act of God, I'm writing it on the board. The sovereign act of God. Uh-huh. Act of God. Whereby he chooses, all right, he chooses some unto salvation. While he passes by others. Now that's, in a, in a nutshell, see on the line, while he passes, while he passes by others. Reprobation in the sovereignty act of God in dealing with salvation. There are those that he chooses. He chooses from the foundation of the world. God chooses those who will be with him. Now, I'm not going to go over the entire two weeks of past two weeks what we've been studying about reprobation. If you want the video, go to my Facebook page and look at that page, uh, view the video. It's about, uh, about 15 minutes long and review part one and part two. All right? Now, to better understand the word reprobation, we also looked at the word approbation. Now write these words down. I'm a spell you want me to spell them to you? A P P Okay. A P P R O D A T I O N. All right. It is, the, it is, what approbation is, is the first part of our definition of reprobation, but it deals with, approbation is, is the act of God loving, loving those only whom he Chooses. I think I spelled the word choose back off up here, so it's chooses. Okay? 
So there are those whom God knew. He foreknew. He knows. He loves. Okay? So approbation comes from the word L O V. Oops. <laughs> L O V E, love. It also is new. N K N E W, to know. Alright? Not every human being will get to know God as their Savior. Alright? There are some whom God will choose, others he will pass by. Now that is a teaching in the scriptures wherein a lot of people do not accept, don't want to know about it, or they don't preach it, or don't teach it. But it's there nevertheless. Our scripture repeatedly that we have been using is John 3.16. Now I know we quote John 3.16, we, we use it in witnessing uh, about Christ, which we should not, because if you do, you're telling people, everybody that you meet, that God loves them, which the scripture tells us that they are those whom God loves. Now, let's, let's wait a minute before you cut me off, listen to what John 3.16 says, for God so loved the world. What, what, what the church has mistakenly for centuries, for decades, centuries, right, has been telling people that God loves you, God loves you, God loves you. This is something we need to stop telling people. Because we really don't know who God loves. Because those whom he loves, he chooses to spend eternity with him. Alright, you follow me? So when you're witnessing to someone, stay clear of telling that sinner, as you was, that God loves you. He died on the cross for you. Oh, repent of your sins. Why don't you get saved? Now, hypothetically, suppose that person doesn't get saved or turn their back on what you said and walk away from you and get, and get hit by a car, choke get uh, killed, fall down the steps, break their neck, or anything could happen and they die. So what will that person do when they stand before the judgment of God, a bar of God, and they say, well, God, you got to let me in. You got to let me into heaven because you love me. You cannot send me away because you love me. So God said, well, who told you that I love you? Well, the preacher told me, and, the, and my aunt witnessed to me, and my, my, my neighbor witnessed to me, but I ignored them, but now I want to get saved. God said, well, it's too late. You died in your sins. You rejected me. But you love me. That's not what the scripture teaches. So what we have done, we have looked at John 3.16 and said, for God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him. And so there it is right there in that verse, whosoever. Whosoever. Whosoever means, now look at the word, whosoever. It does not mean everybody. Because everybody is not going to get saved. Whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who will have everlasting life? The whosoever. Alright, so that's why you have the two words here. Scripture, we've been reading in Romans chapter 9, reprobation and approbation. Reprobation means... Those whom he passes by and chooses not to save. Why? Because he is the sovereign God. Sovereignty means 
that he is governed by his own power. He's governed by his own self. No one can tell him what to do. He knows everything. He sees everything. He knows what's going to happen 10,000 years from now or the next minute from now. And he knew all that before, the, before he made the foundation of the world. That's why he is sovereign, all-powerful, all-knowing God. That's what we mean by sovereign. He's the sovereign God. The scripture teaches that. He knows all things. So he knows Isaiah chapter 46 and 10, I am God. All right? That's what the scripture says, I am God. I, I don't want to misquote it, but let me, let me turn to it real quick. Isaiah 46 and 10. There you go. Right? right went out. Oh, okay. 46 and 10, it says, well, verse 49 also. I guess that like blue. Okay, 46 and 9 says, Remembering the former things of old, for I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from the ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Now, we can't question why God does certain things. Why God allows certain things. Because he is God. He is the sovereign God. We can't question him. We are his creation. The, the clay cannot tell the potter, I want you to make me a vessel tall and long and sleek. No, you, that, that, no, you can't do that. The, the, the potter makes the clay well, out of the clay whatever he wants. And that's who God is. He is the potter. We are clay in his hand. We're just dust. Alright? So that's what we've been talking about for the past uh, two weeks on the sovereignty of God uh, in reprobation, in approbation. God loves. God loves the church. And there it is in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 26. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ loves the church that he gave himself for the church. So Christ, when he died on the cross, he died for the church, not for every human being. Okay. All right. All right. Now let's let's look at it uh, further. Let's take it a little bit further now. So our lesson today, hopefully, by looking at the human will, will allow you to see why God chooses certain individuals. And we we left Romans chapter nine. It says. Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hate. Alright? Remember me, us going through that. Now, turning your Bibles to John chapter 6. As you turn to John 6, permit me to go over what we have on the board here. It says, I have on the board the sovereignty of God in human will. Human will. First of all, let's Let's define what a will, what the will is. All right, the will. Excuse me, the will. Let me erase. Let me erase what's over on this side so we can put down what we want to write here. The sovereignty of God in the human will. What is the will? The will is. The ability to choose. The ability to choose, to decide. Okay. All right. Let, let's say also to make a judgment. All 
Right. But the, the two words I want to use is the word choose to decide the will. That's every one of us has a will. And that's why we're looking at the sovereignty of God in the human will. Now, you remember the last couple of weeks, or the last week, really, we talked about how, and, and remember we told you to read the book of Exodus, how the Pharaoh's heart was hardened by God. Okay, And we looked at the word hardened. And we saw in scriptures that some people, some believe that God intruded into the will of the heart and the mind of Pharaoh and caused Pharaoh to reject the people of Israel. I will not let children of Israel go. And so Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now that is not what God did. He didn't do anything really. Because the word harden, harden is similar to the word reprobation. In that God, when a person hardens his heart, he don't want, he rejects God, alright? But it's, it's not only that he rejects God, God rejects him and don't want him. Now to us, as humans, we can't accept that because of our click click definition of love. Oh, let's love everyone, let's love, let's love. God is love, God is love, and the scripture does teach us God is love. But let's look at what the scripture teaches about love, what love really is. Not our concept of love, but what the scripture teaches about love. And once again, I'm reading from 1 Corinthians um, chapter uh, 13 and dealing with love. 1 Corinthians 13 verse 4 and uh, through uh, 8. Okay, here we go. 1 Corinthians 13, uh, <coughs> verse 4. Listen to what it says about the true Bible definition of love. See, we think, we think when we as Christians, see, this is what's thrown at us because we're Christians. They say, well, because you don't, uh, uh, you, you must hate homosexuals. You must hate that person. You must hate. No, no. See, we have a different, human beings have a different understanding of the word love. Okay? Uh, we say, the scripture says, different <laughs> in dealing with love. Uh, when we say, as Christians, that God wants you to repent of your sin of Solomonite. Men loving men, women loving women. That's Solomon. They call it what? Homosexuality, lesbian, etc. Or the word gay. Uh, we say God, God, God loves. And that is true. But see, in the sovereignty of God, Him being God, He can love and hate sin. When we receive Christ as Savior, we love God and hate sin. A true Christian doesn't practice sin. But a true Christian is still capable of sinning. And we'll look at that later on in this in this lesson. Alright? But let's look at the definition of the Bible says about love in 1 Corinthians 13 and 4. Charity or love suffers long. Love is kind. Love envies not. Love vaunteth not itself. Love is not puffed up. Love does not behave itself unseemly. Love seeks not her own. Love is not easily provoked. Love thinks no evil. Love rejoices not in sin, but rejoices in truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, and hopes all things, and endures. Now I want you to focus on what Paul was saying here. He said love 
love concerning, he says, rejoices not in sin. All right. Love behave itself does not behave itself unseemly. Now, I, I, I want you to picture in your mind about all the sinful acts that we are capable of doing, and God says, I don't like that in your life. That's an abomination for you to do that. That is sinful. That is wrong. You need to repent. For you to love a man as a man, the scripture says, that's unseemly. That's sin. So if you love, you don't love sin. Now, that lets us see that, well, ought not God, being the sovereign God, creator of man, earth, creation of everything, does not he have the right to choose whom he wants and those whom he do not want? And that's specifically what Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11 is speaking about, which we have past studied about. So therefore, we're going to look at the sovereignty of God in human will. The will is the ability to choose, to decide. That's what the human will is. Now, number one, the will of God towards all of his creation. God has a will that is towards all his creation. The will of God towards all his creation. Then there is the will of man. It is towards God and himself. Now, we're leading up to the next segment after the human will, sovereignty of God and human will, which is the sovereignty of God and human will responsibility. So whether you're saved or not, you still have a will. Whether you save or not, you still have a responsibility towards your creator, towards God. So don't get out of this saying, well, because I'm not a Christian, I don't need to go to church, I don't need to worship God, I don't need, no. It is God's, he is the creator, and he says, you ought to worship me. But there's a problem. And that's why we're studying this. Because our will should be towards God and ourselves. What God wills and what we will. But, but our will is governed by our nature. Watch this now. The human will is governed by our human nature. The will of God is governed by his sovereignty. Now, in God's sovereignty, he loves and he cannot, he cannot be tempted by sin, neither tempt him any man to sin. He does not provoke anyone. He does not put sin in anybody's heart. And that lets us know from last week's lesson, it's not that God put sin in Pharaoh's heart and caused him to reject God, or God put sin into Judas' heart that made Judas betray Jesus. What Jesus did, what God did was, he passed by and let Pharaoh make up his own decision, his own will. Because Pharaoh's will, Judas' will, was governed by their nature as our will is governed by our nature. Then you got to look at, where's my ruler here? Then you got to look at, what is the nature of man? What is the nature of man? So, when we look at these scriptures, and we look at the will of God, we say, well... Does not God want all his creation to serve him and to worship him? Yes, that is the supreme. What is it, old man, that you should be doing in the book of Micah? To worship God, to serve your God, because he is your creator. So what hinders us as human beings, the highest of all God's creation, from worshiping the one true God? 
our nature. So, so, well, what happened? Glad you asked that question, Sherman. Glad you asked that question. Now, the human will, when God made Adam, Right. When God made Adam, God gave Adam a will. All right. Now, some of you that has been with us at Christian Bible Chapel for some time now, you, you may be familiar with this chart. All right. You may be familiar with this chart. I might have to hold this. If I had some piece of tape, I could take that. All right. Um, so, therefore... The human will, the human ability, the human choosing. When God made Adam, he gave Adam a will. All right? In that, Adam, before the fall, before the fall, Adam was able to, when God made Adam, Adam was able to sin, at the same time, able not to sin. Because he had a choice, he had a will to decide. Right. Now, I don't know where we get that phrase, man is a free moral agent, he can do what he wants. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. Okay, <laughs> you know. And that's why, see, the reason I'm saying that is because you can tell many churches that believe in the free will of man to decide whether he want to receive Christ because it's labeled in their church. Like Free Will Baptist Church, Free Will Holiness Church. See, that lets you know that you can decide, you can make the choice, but you, don't, you can't make the choice. And we're going to show you the scripture that man cannot make that choice. I told you about John 6, right? Hold on to it. So when God made Adam, the pre-fall, before Adam fell, God made Adam, all right, able to sin. Now, Adam hadn't sinned yet, remember me now. But yet at the same time, Adam and Eve were able to sin. Adam and Eve was able not to sin. Follow that now. Now, let's look at the next one. Post-fall of man. After Adam fell, what happened? He's able to sin, and he's unable not to sin. You see that? Because of sin. Alright? Did I lose anyone? Let me go back again. Before Adam sinned, before God, when God created Adam, he created Adam in innocence. He gave Adam a will. He wasn't tempted yet. Right? This before Genesis chapter 3 with the serpent and, and you know and all that, right? So he was able to sin. But he hadn't sinned yet, right? But he's able to. And yet at the same time, he able, he's able to not sin. And that means that able, Adam could have told Eve, Eve, you've done the wrong thing. I'm not eating the apple. The fruit, I'm sorry. I'm not eating the fruit. Eve could have said, well, uh, honey, you know, it, it'll make us gods. It'll make us wise. Adam said, no, God says not to eat of that tree. I'm not. He's not. He's able not to sin. What happened was Adam sinned. He fell into sin. Since the fall of man, He's able to sin, and he's at the point right now, even from Adam to today, he's unable not to sin. Now, something happened. Something happened here. Right, if you're viewing this on YouTube or, on, the, or on, on, on Facebook, you see me. See this here? This word here, reborn man, means a person got saved. Now, watch this now. In a reborn state, being born again, saved, once again, the new person in Christ is able to sin and able not to sin. You see? A Christian, a saint, 
a child of God is able to sin and able not to sin. So when he's tempted, remember what, see, see over here, Adam and Eve, he could have said, Eve, no, I'm not doing it. When you're tempted to, you know, get drunk, to lie, cheat, steal, fornicate, and that, you can say no. As a new person in Christ, as Adam was. See, see, see the, see the, see the same category here in reborn man is the same as the pre-fall man. Now when we are glorified, one day when we are glorified, when Jesus Christ comes back in glory, he changes our body to be fashioned like his body. All Christians <laughs> will be able not, able to not sin and unable to sin. See, that, that now, now we have a different category here. Able to not sin, which as a believer we can still, you know, but there's something super extraordinary here, extraordinary, is that now as a new person with a glorified body, we're unable to sin because it's been changed, it's been wiped out. Right. I'm gonna try and read that up there so you can copy it, and you know as I move back and forth there. All right. Now I told you to turn turn to Romans, uh, excuse me, John chapter six, because I want to look at these very important passages of scriptures in dealing with the definition of the word. And not only that, I want to read also concerning what Saint Augustine and um, also. What uh, another author have, have given us uh, in telling us about the nature, the ability to sin, all right? The human will, all right? In John chapter 6, do you have that there? John chapter 6, all right? Verse 37. Now, what you're going to hear from verse 37 down to 44 and then 65, 66, is the word come and will. You're going to see those two words, come and will. Watch, follow me now. John, St. John 6, 37. All that the Father gives me shall come to me. And him or her, they that comes to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. This is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he has given me, I given me, I should lose nothing but should raise it up again at the last day. This is the will of him that sent me that everyone that sees the Son and believe on him may have everlasting life. Let's go down to verse 44. No man can come to me unless the Father which has sent me, draw him, and I will raise him up. So you see, it's the same thing in verse 65 where it says, Therefore I say unto you, No man can come to me except it was given unto him of my Father. So when we see the phrase in verse 37, 44, and 65, it's repeated. No man can come. So that's what the word will, the ability to choose. To do, the ability to decide. Because what, what happened, there it is, the fall of man. Sin. Now sin is not a disease. Sin is not a, a tissue or something that is labeled on our heart, in our mind. Sin is just simply disobedience. Sin is unrighteousness. It's disobedience. I 
that's all they see to me. See, it's the, see, we make something out of, 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 of what the scriptures, like the, like the number 666, Mark of the Beast, we, 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 we make it a mark on us when it's not a mark. It's the same thing like sin. Sin is disobedience, wrongdoing. So therefore, in the will of man, we do not have the ability to come, to decide, to choose. Because of what? Sin. What? So that should make you look at the past lesson of reprobation more acceptable. You say, oh yeah, now I see. We're born in sin and shaped in iniquity. Our hearts are deceitful. Our minds are dull. Our ears can't hear. Our throats are full. So that's why we can't make the right decision or choose God. See, God has to choose us. If God never chose anybody, all will be condemned. That's why the scripture says, For God so loved the world that whosoever believes in him. So you see, God has to intervene in a person's life and draw them. And so that's what born again means. Born again is the act of God when, see, if God doesn't move within us and, 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 and convicts us and stirs us up and opens our eyes, we will not make God our Savior. We will not repent. We will not believe. Because we will go on our way just like everybody else and die in their sins. But what happened is that God chose you. And at the right time in March 24, 1974, he says, Sherman, it's time for you to get saved. I already marked it out way back in eternal past. But now, you are born, you're at this age, I want you to be saved. Well, well, what about my brother? What about, I say you. I didn't say them, I say you. See, we can't get saved for our others. Or we can't make people get saved. We just tell them the gospel. The, the, the good news and the bad news of the gospel. That's what we tell them. It takes God. Right? It takes God to intervene in our nature. And remember, our nature, let me write it down here, is sinful, is wicked, is depraved, what? It's deceitful. I think I'm spelling these words right. And that's our nature. Right? You see that? See, our will towards God and ourselves is governed by our nature. And our nature, remember this now, our nature, remember the post after Adam fell, our nature is we are sinful. We are wicked. We are depraved. We are deceitful. The heart is deceitful and desperately wicked. Over and over again throughout the scriptures. And that, beloved, that right there lets us know that our will has been tainted by sin. If our will has not been tainted by sin, we all would be like in this first category here. But we're not. We're tainted by sin in the second category. Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jake, every all have sin and come short of the glory of God. Holy Mary, Mother of God, is a sinner. John the Baptist, a sinner. Paul, a sinner. Joseph, father, earthly father of Jesus, a sinner. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. All need to face the wrath of God. Every last 
last one of us need to be destroyed because we are sinners. But Romans 5 and 8 says, But God, who is rich in his mercy, wherein he loved us. There it is again. Christ came to die for us. If Christ came into the world, let me, let me say this hypothetically. Suppose Christ came into the world to die for every human being, as some preaches that, some preachers preach that, then why do people die in their sins? Why are some people who say, I don't want to trust Christ, I'm going to die, I don't believe in heaven, I don't believe, I don't want to go to hell with everybody else, I don't, uh, God, there ain't no God, no kids, so... Why doesn't everyone get saved? Because he didn't die for the whole human race. So the point that we want to look at here is we have a problem and that problem is we don't have the freedom of our will. Now, let me define that. We have freedom to choose in the natural realm. You know? We have a choice to choose who we want to marry, who we, what car we want, what house, who we want to date, who we want to do, what we want to do, what college, what school. We can choose the color of our clothes, the shoes, the stores, the food. In the natural realm, we can choose. We can make those choices. In this room, I chose certain things to be in this room. You chose certain things to be in your house. That's what God gave us, the ability to choose. He gave us a will. But we have to all also realize that our will, our ability to choose, has been tainted by sin. And therefore, in dealing with God, salvation, spiritual things, we cannot choose, right? And this is the reason why we got all these religions, all these different cults and groups and everything, because we we have we don't, we can't make the right decision. We can't choose right. In the spiritual religious realm, we can't. And Satan knows that. So he dealt, he deals with that. He care less if you own this and have this and prosperous and rich. But what he don't want is don't get saved. Don't get saved. That's the thing I don't want. So our liberty and our freedom is tainted by sin. This is what St. Augustine and Jonathan Edwards was writing in their writings about the freedom of the will. Martin Luther, the bondage of the will. Our will is bondage. Bondage is in bondage, is in captivity by sin. Let me go back to my chart. When God made Adam, Adam enjoyed God's fellowship. He enjoyed the animals. He enjoyed the plant life, eating the food. He, I mean, he was... All right. <laughs> Tell me you came, right? <laughs> okay, no, I just said. Okay, Adam was all right until he disobeyed God. Once he disobeyed God, his will, his freedom was shattered. He, he had the ability to sin now. But also, Right? He had the ability that he couldn't stop sinning. It was part of him now, as all of us. We can't help ourselves. Remember that song back in the 60s? I can't help myself. It's not like in the 60s when Fred Wilson says the devil made me do it. No, it's sin. The devil didn't tell you to do anything. It was sin. Sin. But once a person gets saved, they have the ability to sin, but at the same time, they have the ability not to sin. All right? So, the 
when the two writers here said that our desires to serve God and please God as Adam did is not the same. Something intrude in our lives which is sin and cause us to have a serious state of a moral bondage, a moral inability to do to do wrong. Now that brings us to the point of the matter in which we look at two other things. Okay? When Adam sinned, let's look at let's look at um, let's look at two things here. We have on the board here two words, or two phrases rather. We have on the board the original sin, okay, and then we have the first sin. When we speak of the, of the phrase original sin, it speaks of the results of being this old, excuse me, disobedient. Alright? That's the original sin. What is the first sin? It's only one word. What is it? What is the first sin? Sign the D. Disobey. or disobedient. Yeah. Right. That's it. That's the first sin. But what is the results of being disobedient? Man is cursed, man don't know God, man walk away from God, man is blind, he, his will is crushed and he can't, you know, he, that's the results. Dust thou art, dust you shall return, you're going to eat the fruit of the ground, and all oh, that's the results of man disobedience. What is the ultimate, is the ultimate result of man disobedience? The second death. So when we see this, the Bible lets us know that man is in a uh, is in a moral condition. He's in a, and that's why we turn to uh, John chapter six to look at Jesus' view. Let's go over it again. No man can come. Look at verse forty-four. No man can come to me except the Father draw. You see that in verse uh, 44 of John 6, 44? No man can. Now, when we was in uh, second grade, third grade, the teacher would say, from, you students, from now on, if you want to go to the bathroom or something, you have to raise your hand and say, Miss Adams, may I go to the bathroom? Yes, you may. This is what it means. No man can. May I? May I get saved, Lord? Can I get saved? May I? So the scripture says, no man may or can come to me. May I come to you, Lord? You have no part in coming to God. You can't say, Lord, I want to come to you. Lord, Lord, will you save me? Out of, out, out of the blue moon, we will never, ever accept Jesus. Receive Jesus. It takes the power of God to first draw a person. As God draws you to him, he changes your mind, your will, he changes your heart. At the same time, he has someone or track or the gospel message presented to you and you hear. Then you say, the scripture says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. Call means you're making an appeal. See, once you hear, see, that's why it's so important to hear the true gospel. Because a lot of people hear a false gospel and they, they say they're saved, but they're not really saved. They can go for 60 or 109 years thinking that they're really saved and die in their sins. And this is so Impossible for a person to 
feel like they're saved, know that they're saved, guarantee that they're saved, but they're not really saved. So how do you know? Because of the truth of the word of God, you must repent of your sins. Repent means change your mind about yourself, change your mind about sin, change your mind about God. You must cry out to him and say, Lord, forgive me of my sin. I trust Jesus as my Savior. Forgive me. Save me. Well, you say, preacher, I did that. See, now, watch this now. See, at the closing of that, you begin to live a new life. A new life proves that you have changed. If any person be in Christ, they are a new creation. See that? Your old life is past. Your new life. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. See, you're going to have people at the judgment bar of God that's going to say, Lord, did not preach in your name. Lord, did not join the church. Lord, did not speak in tongues. Lord, did not get baptized. Lord, did not feel that I was saved. Lord, did not say the sinner's prayer. Lord, did not come to the altar. Lord, did not clap my hand and say, Jesus, Jesus. Lord, did not. Jesus, I never knew you. Depart from me. See, this is the reason why when you know that you are saved, you will live a new life. It's not going to be a perfect life. Because remember now, in our chart here, remember? In our chart here, remember? In reborn, you're able to sin, but you're able not to sin. So you're not perfect. The point is that he that is born of God does not practice sin. For you to say that you're a believer in Christ and practicing sin, then that something is wrong. You have been slipped a counterfeit. And see, this is the reason why we have all these shenanigans and problems and fightings and wars and mishaps and fornication and wife swapping and stealing and embezzlement and fornication in the church because these folks are not safe. And that's the reason. It's, it's not, that's the pure fact. They're not safe. And that's why we should not be following Hollywood style of church but what the Bible says. Because if any person be in Christ, there is a new creature. So you can't be a, a, a new person in Christ and say, I know the scripture says a uh, husband of one wife, but the Lord told me that I could, it's all right for me to have two wives. See, something is wrong. See, see, that's why Jesus says, you can't come to me unless I first draw you. Let me give you an illustration, another illustration. Suppose I'm talking to a person, and I'm talking to them about Christ, about witnessing, and you're talking to a person. You're talking to your best friend, or you're talking to your daughter. You're talking to someone you love. You desperately want them to be saved. You're turning blue and pink in the face. Oh, get saved. Please get saved. God, God loves you. God wants you. And see, all what you do and say will make them get saved. Unless God draw them. See, the point is, the only thing we, the only job we here on earth as Christians ought to do is to speak truth to people about the gospel and let the Holy Spirit do his work. We can't force and make people get saved. A true person, the scripture says, no man has the ability to come to me unless the Father draw him. I say it again, verse 65. No man can come to me except it was given unto him by the Father. Now, doesn't it stand for reason? Those whom God gave to Jesus, there are those whom the Father does not give to Jesus. He chooses some. He does not choose all. 
Now, in our next lesson that we're going to look at uh, with, uh, next week, Lord's willing, we're going to look at the, 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 uh, the teaching of the scriptures which deals with hu every human being, every human being has a responsibility. You are culpable. The word culpable is it's a big word for responsibility. You are responsible for your own sin. Well, God can't condemn. How can God condemn me if I'm born a sinner and, and, and I'm shaped in iniquity and I, and I reject him and die in my sins? How can he send me? Wait a minute. You are still responsible for your sin. You are a creation of God. God made you the highest women, men, boys, girls, teenagers. God made you, and you, he didn't make you a sinner. He created you, but it existed because of Adam, therefore by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. Why will you stay in your, your weakness? Why will you stay in your sin? I made you. I created you. But you were born in sin. I didn't put sin in you. You were born in sin and shaped in iniquity. We cannot accuse God of putting sin in you. Well, well, well he's God and he, he should get rid of it and, and I should be able to go to heaven. No, you need to repent. Every human being is responsible for their sin and they need to repent of their sin. Well, why did God go? Listen to me. Listen, listen now. The sovereignty of God. You, you, you're asking me questions where only God can answer. Why did he do That's God. And you, well, if you make it to heaven, you ask God, why did he go through that channel like that? All right? Because I don't know. And if I did know, I would be on an equal balance with God, right? Okay. But our desires are corrupt. Our liberty is tainted. We're in a serious state of moral rebellion with the inability to make the right choice towards God. Now, so God, seeing this, he has to step in and say, let me step in and save Sherman. Let me step in and save Abraham. And the reason why he steps in and saves certain ones, because he chose them from the foundation of the world. It's not that he saw me better than my brother. He said, oh, no, I, I, I don't like his ways. I don't like his actions. But I like Sherman's actions and his ways. No, that has nothing to do with it. That's why we looked at, in our past lesson, about Jacob and Esau. And if you read the Old Testament, you will really find out that Jacob was a better brother than Esau was. I mean, Esau, excuse me, Esau was a better brother than Jacob. Jacob was conniving. He was deceitful. I mean, and his mother loved it. See, that's the reason why you shouldn't come up to uh, show favoritism to your children. But, but his mother did. And the father loved Esau, and the mother loved Jacob. Now, how can you run a family like that? But that's what happened. And so Jacob deceived, was conniving, while his brother Esau was honest. Though he... After he found out that his brother loved, his father loved his brother, Jacob, more than him, Jacob did anything displeasing to his father. But that's another story. All right? We're going to close out today in reading the book of Proverbs because there are some scriptures that I want you to throw out at you in the book of Proverbs to speak on this matter. How many of you remember reading when Joshua said in Joshua chapter 24, he says, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which is on your fathers, which your fathers served, 
on the other side of the flood or the gods of the Amorites. You choose. In the book of Proverbs, Proverbs, let's go to Proverbs chapter 16 first. You can just write this down. Proverbs chapter 16, verses 1. The scripture says, the preparation of the heart is in man. And the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Now, I want you to I want you to meditate and think on these scriptures here. The preparation of the heart, the preparation of the heart in man, and the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Verse 4. The Lord has made all things for himself, yes, even the wicked, for the day of evil. Verse 9. Proverbs 16, 9. A man's heart devises his way, but the Lord directs his steps. See, everyone that's walking out there, everyone in England, in Liverpool, in Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, United States, Los Angeles, Quebec, the Philippines, Guam, Hawaii, all over, they're doing things. They're acting the part. And everything they do is under the sovereign will of God. That's what Proverbs 16 and verse 9 is talking about. Proverbs 21. The king's heart is in the hand of the Lord as the river of water. He turns it whithersoever he will. Every way of a man is right in his own eyes, but the Lord ponders the heart. So you see, our will, our heart, our will, and our mind has been tainted by God. And God has to intervene if he chooses into a person's life and saves them. But yet not all will be saved. We want all to be saved, but that's not the plan of God. Any questions? So the will is the faculty of choice, is the, the all the actions, all the deciding and everything. But the point is our will has been tainted by sin. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you for the word of God. We thank you. Father, for the truths of your word, we pray, O oh God, that, that many will fall on their knees and cry out to God, what must I do to be saved? May they cry out in repentance. May they cry out in true faith. Lord, we pray that your spirit will draw many to you right now. Loved ones, those in church, those in the community, those in our government, those in our society, people we work with, people we don't even know. May the power of the Holy Spirit draw and save before it is eternal too late. That person right now that is contemplating suicide, killing themselves and, and maybe their own children, that person that's getting ready to be walked in front of a bus or in a car accident. That person is getting ready to possibly, they might fall down the steps. That person, wherever they may be, Lord, we pray before that time, before that happened, may they repent of their sins and trust Jesus Christ as Savior before it's too late. We thank you, Father, for your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I know a lot of people are going to use that Second Peter 3 and 9, I think. It says it's not the Lord's will for any to perish. Again, that, that speaks of the believer. So next week we're going to look at, uh, as the Lord leads, the sovereignty of God and human will. And we're going to find out how the, every human being is responsible for their sin. And if you reject Christ, you will be punished for it, your sin. Amen. 
All right, everybody. Well, let's move. Let's see this Sunday. We'll post the. Uh, we're going back to our regular schedule on Sunday mornings. That means uh, beginning on Sunday morning to Sunday evenings. We'll post it on Facebook. All right. Okay. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.